Welcome to Popcorn Psychology, the podcast where we watch blockbuster movies and psychoanalyze them. My name is Brittany Brownfield, and I'm a child therapist, and I'm joined by... Ben Stover, individual therapist. Hannah Espinoza, marriage and family therapist. We are all licensed clinical professional counselors, also known as therapists, who practice out of Chicago. Even though we are licensed mental health professionals, this podcast is purely for entertainment purposes and to fulfill our love of dissecting pop culture in all forms. Please remember that even though we are all licensed therapists, we aren't your therapist. If you are struggling with mental health symptoms, please find a local mental health provider. So today we are going to be doing the first of our holiday movies. We're going to be doing a much requested movie that kind of actually merges two holidays together. So we're going to be talking about Nightmare Before Christmas. Um, I think a pretty big cultural movie. I think a lot of people know about it already. But in case you don't, it is the story of Jack Skellington, um, who is the Pumpkin King <laughs> of Halloween Town, who um, starts to feel some melancholy, some ennui about his life, and therefore um, finds Christmas Town and decides that he's going to be santa claus sandy claus whatever you want to call it um simultaneously we're getting the story of sally who is the product of um, evil scientist and kind of having a big crush on him and sort of her trying to find herself at the same time that jack's trying to find himself and they find each other at the end so today Aww. we're going to be talking about identity for both jack and sally um and kind of how they're both the, their identities are being shaped and hindered within the microcosm that they're in. So for Jack, uh, that is Halloween Town, his place in that society. So the role we play within our fam, uh, within our families or our communities or the society at large. We're also going to be talking about with Jack specifically the pressure of expectations and how that can lead to burnout, and then. Um, basically existential crisis or midlife crisis, which I think is what feels for me at least the most explicitly stated in this movie, like a dude who's like, who am I? And I'm tired of the life I live now. And let's buy a red sports car and date a model and become the king of Christmas too. <laughs> um, and then we're also going to be talking about <laughs> Sally and kind of how she's more from an abusive family, if we're going to put it like that, with her relationship with Doc. So um, we'll jump into it. So with Jack, um, what are we seeing in terms of his role in his society, his role of Halloween Town and the rigidity of that? So what we see is right at the beginning, Jack gets this huge intro with This is Halloween, where mm -hmm. you know he goes through the the large production of becoming in and like, being ridden in on a was it on a horse? Yeah, or, you know, and he comes well, in as a scarecrow. Parade. I think it's yeah, a, the that's Halloween, a, parade. It's a Halloween parade. Yeah, there's a Halloween parade. But there's a Halloween parade. But he's but the, it's a big celebratory. Like we did it again. Yeah. Right. It's grandiose. Yeah. Like and um, what's so interesting where this movie grabs your attention right away is that as soon as that's over, he's you know Jack the Pumpkin King, and then immediately like he goes into complete exasperation and, and burnout with that role. Yes. So we see, like, Jack playing this role for everybody else, where he's taking on this identity of the Pumpkin King. And yes. then I'm going <laughs> to do that, it. like, 12 times today, so oh, just great. sorry. <laughs> Apologies to this movie. <sighs> Blame Danny Elfman. It's his fault. Because every time they zoom right in on the camera and mm -hmm. his face changes and he yeah. gets dramatic. But the, the thing that I like about it, or that we see with his roles, is that he has this role that he plays for the town versus when he's himself. And it's dramatically different throughout most of this film. Well, I think where he really falls a lot of victim in terms of the role he plays within his society is that he is in a very isolated role. Um, he is the king. Um, so he's separated a lot from everyone else, like from the citizenry, I guess, of Halloween Town. Um, he, when he's in that tower besides his dog, he's very, like, zero, he's very much by himself. Um, he, when you can see all the way, like, the mayor talks to him, there's this expectation that he has to be a certain person for all of them. Mm -hmm. Um, and no one really 
treats him like a peer. Everyone treats him like the king, which I imagine, I don't know a lot of kings or monarchs in real life. I have watched The Crown and I'm a big fan of Queen Elizabeth from the outside American perspective. But it does, I wouldn't be surprised if it is kind of a good example of the isolation of being in that role where you have to be something so much for other people that you don't really ever get to be yourself or get the comfort of being vulnerable the way that you can be with a peer to peer that if you're in a power position, you can't really be, or at least the other people don't want you to be. Because I think a big part of for him and being a leader in a lot of ways is it's not just that you don't want to be vulnerable around other people. But people really don't want you to be vulnerable with them because they want to think of you as this powerful, um, infallible, like perfect God creature. Like they're not a real person to them. You are a um, what's we're looking for? A symbol. You're a yeah, symbol. For he's, them. A, he's a celebrity. Yeah, he is. He has absolute celebrity status in this. Mm-hmm. And at, as such, he has this societal pressure to always be on. Yes. To always be be the beacon of everything that is Halloween, everything that is great about what they do, and to represent the very best of all of them and to carry the enthusiasm and positivity mm-hmm. for everyone. It, yeah, I mean, because when he's doing all this bemoaning, like sadness and like ennui and all this stuff, he's by himself. He's wandering through the graveyard, dope, just singing to himself <laughs> and feeling sad, like me circa 2002. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I have an image of you like dressed as Wednesday Adams wandering. Actually, around was the not graveyard. as much of a scene kid in high school as I should have been. Yeah, and maybe would have been if I had the resources to shop at Hot Topic a lot heavier. Yeah. Um, but he really doesn't have anyone to confide in. At best, he has, like I said, his dog to confide in. He doesn't really have anyone to, um, kind of bounce off how he's feeling and get some perspective about it too. Yeah, and I feel like part of that has to do with him, like, he's the one who has all the answers, right? So he's the one who's, he's a genius, he has all, says all the perfect things, like, I think that that's part of why nobody would even think he would need to bounce ideas off of them, because he has all of the best ideas, yeah. So I think it's also that thing where, again, having to play the role of being a perfect person or mm-hmm. or the role that they've defined for you already that, that yes. you have to step into. I mean, I think when Anthony Bourdain died, um, a, a meme that was not a meme, but like a like a thing that was going around on like social media was you should ask your strongest, quote unquote, strongest friend if they're OK, um, because we do put people in box two in terms of strength and um durability kind of and so i think with jack he also has the persona in that town of someone who knows their shit like he's a strong person we don't need to worry about jack jack's got it figured out and so those people can be can definitely fall victim to that as well like i know i use like we talked about celebrities and monarchs but also like within our families there's people that we don't check on, quote unquote, because they've got it together. And so those people will suffer in silence um, because they aren't given the space within their family or their community to be vulnerable because they are the strong one. Yeah. And I was actually just thinking that, that it's a lot about how we have roles in families and how, you know, clearly Jack's role is of someone who is untouchable and someone who makes all the like the golden child, like the one who makes all of the Mm -hmm. best decisions and doesn't have to ask for anything and is good at everything that he does. And so and I think that's a really uh, good example of kind of trying to show instead of going with the idea of a monarch going, you know, Mm -hmm. also putting into a family perspective of, of what that would be like. And again, how isolating that can be, because when it's assumed that you know everything or that you have everything that you need or that you, I, I really don't like using strong or strength yeah. at all, but um, maybe just the resilience to get through things that people assume that mm-hmm. you have. I think that that you're exactly right, that then the space isn't there. And then also that the person doesn't feel like they can yes. say anything. Like, mm-hmm. even if there was the space, whether or not they would be able to do that, because then we also look at how the family, how is the family going to respond to this person stepping down and saying, you know what, I really, I'm 
fucking sick of doing the fucking Halloween mm-hmm. parade. Like, I really want to do something else. I want to do something different. I want to find meaning in a different place. And he is not in a place where he can t- say that to anyone besides his dog. Mm-hmm. Which is why it makes sense then that he does arguably a super over the top bonkers thing, which is take over an entire other holiday. <laughs> because one, he's been built up as a very hyper confident person. Yeah. And so I bet you there's a part of him that thinks he's pretty infallible as well. He's Yeah. And then How could he not be? How could he not yeah. think that? Yeah. And then also he um doesn't have anyone to, like I said, bounce ideas off of. So it, he doesn't ask anyone, like, hey, would it be crazy if I, like, <laughs> took over a whole other holiday? <laughs> so I, it makes sense. And I think that's why sometimes people who aren't being, who seem like they have it together, will all of a sudden do really abnormal stuff for them. Because they are in a bubble of, no, I wouldn't say their own making, but a, a bubble that's been created because of, different like many factors and so then they will do stuff and everyone around them is like what the hell is going on which we do kind of see here yeah everyone's like so surprised and struggles to accept that jack is not just happy with his current circumstances and now how often do we get clients coming in saying just exactly that thing mm-hmm. like that exact statement or that sentiment coming into you know, like i have so much going on for me but i don't have time or energy or the ability to get my needs met because i have to be this symbol for everybody else and then when i do show a slight like hey maybe i want to do everyone's like well not that but it's jack it i feel like the mayor just wanders around this whole movie going but jack and also they don't give him space like he's gone for a night yeah and, and they're lo- like like red alert Everyone, like, the mayor is, like, openly sobbing in town square. <laughs> right. Because they Everybody can't, they haven't been able to get eyeballs on Jack for maybe 10 hours. Yeah, exactly. So then he's also, it's this horrible combination of being very isolated, but yet then being suffocated simultaneously. Yeah. And I think that's what makes this movie appeal to so many people and why we got so many requests for it is mm-hmm. that I think a lot of people identify pretty strongly with Jack and his plight of... Like, being in this position where you have to put on a mask, which is interesting for a Halloween slash Christmas movie, that he has to put on a mask <laughs> mm. and be this character for everyone else to be the support. But internally, he's struggling with his identity and what he wants and how to make himself feel whole again, where, you know, like, just doing this thing for everybody else no longer fills him up anymore, despite he's the best person at it. And everyone <laughs> expects that of him. Mm-hmm. And when he tries to step outside of the role... It creates a crisis. It's like, and you see this in other things. Like, honestly, what just popped in my head was uh, when, uh, from How I Met Your Mother, when Robin goes from Robin Sparkles to Robin Daggers. Like, mm-hmm. she she's like this pop queen sensation in Canada, this teen sensation, and then uh, randomly in the '90s decides to go from like, let's go to the mall to. Mm-hmm goth but i think you see that with a lot of like real celebrities not just characters and absolutely um, is like i mean the trope is a teen actor usually a teen actress or you know what i mean or a popular kid actress Mm -hmm. who's tries to reinvent themselves as an adult quote unquote like a capital a adult and there's can be a lot of foibles and fumbles with that because because with that situation, which is real people, and then with Jack, is you're trying on it. Instead of really, like, looking inward and saying, hey, who am I? What do I need? Like, what's going on for me that I need to change? You look outward and literally just put another identity on. Right. Because Jack's not, he doesn't create a whole other holiday that feels true to him or a whole other role that's true for him. He just appropriates Christmas. And Santa Claus. Right. Uh, yeah, like see Garth Brooks slash Chris Gaines. Ugh, I don't want to. Don't make me. Yeah, but it's the same. <laughs> but see, that's the same thing, though. I'm yeah. happy to say that I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. And it makes me feel really good. Garth Brooks uh, did this wild thing where he, like, decided I, he was no, going to be I, an edgy alternative person and then, like, made a whole persona it about it. And like, it was real weird. Right. Like, right when he was at the the absolute height of country. Like, I don't like country music at all. But, like, when right when he was at the height, like, the king of country, he was like, I want to be a rock star. And, like, switched and created a whole, like, second persona with, like, long hair and, and a like soul, a soul patch. patch. <laughs> <laughs> That's important okay. to mention. 
I got to show you pictures later, but the like <laughs> okay. it's it's the same thing. But the, like, look at the reaction people have to it. Like, but you're but no, you can't do. The, you're the country guy. You do the country stuff. Well, and I was thinking, and what I was thinking when you guys were talking about that is also that when that person also says, "Hey, I'm having a hard time." The system freaks the fuck out. Like they don't yeah. know, and they go to more to a crisis mode. Like mm-hmm. you're not supposed to be like this. What does this mean? Does this mean that all of us are crazy? Does this mean yeah. that you never were who you were before? Does this mean that we were wrong about you? There's so and how that has such, in some ways, that effect is such a devastating quality that mm-hmm. goes with it because now all the people who have been you know, standing behind you and kind of blowing smoke up your ass the whole time. And now all of a sudden think that you have, you have no, uh, I can't think of the word. (laughs) You have no weight anymore to things that you do because they can't trust you. And I think what's hard about, Oh God. Oh, Ben is showing. I'm showing Hannah, Chris Gaines. (laughs) Still not attractive. So oh, don't be rude to Dorothy. why else you wish you're showing me a picture of what he looks like what do you want me to say <laughs> <laughs> but with i think also what's tricky for jack which we've talked about a little bit is that he's also in what could you could consider like a successful ecosystem like it is a um society that's working for everybody else and they're feeling the success of it which i think is also if we're going to go back to like kid actors or kid pop sensations trying to become adult ones is don't fuck with the brand don't fuck with like what's giving us success what's working for everybody else um what's making everybody money Absolutely. Um, because and you know just suck up your end of it like i don't necessarily think howling town's doing that because i don't think they have the direct of a confrontation because yeah. jack goes off and comes back with we've got christmas but i think what we do see is the rigidity that presents in these situations where even when he's trying to explain Christmas to them, they're keep putting it into the frame of reference of Halloween and the schema that they have of Halloween. And you can tell how frustrated Jack gets because, and he's, I think he even point blank says it like, I'm trying to explain something totally different to them and they keep making it Halloween. And so I guess I have to then make it a little more Halloween like, which is a shame, I guess. I mean, he's still like, taking but christmas also, but like but he also tries yeah. for like two minutes true like <laughs> so but then he does and then because he doesn't have anyone to bounce ideas off kind of goes on this kind of wild goose chase of what he's trying to figure out right Where like he's using the books mm-hmm. and the scientific method but like he's uh, yeah. but like also doesn't really have because s- he's still not listening to himself exactly he's because not he's trying to, to like his intuition make up a reason why it should work I mean, it's kind of confusing i'm not exactly sure what he because again we don't know what the goal is like you can't use the scientific method and not have something that you're trying to prove or disprove well i don't think he's being honest about the goal yeah which is yeah. that i'm unhappy yeah and because this isn't fulfilling me anymore he's just trying to stick a christmas-sized band-aid on it well he had he had the, an experience right you see this a lot where people like go out and they go to a, a conference or they go to something and they're like, oh my god, I had this like life changing experience and now like I want to bring that to everybody else. And we see him do that when he discovers Christmas Town. It's like I started doing yoga and now like it's changed my life. And now I'm shove like, yoga on everyone's throats. <laughs> I, I mean, but that's what he does. Yeah, that's I mean, what he does. I mean, he puts on a presentation about mm-hmm. um, changing ev- changing everything to be Christmas like. So, I mean, Which, I, I mean, think it's inaccurate. And I think where Jack is wrong, I mean, he's wrong about a lot of things in this movie, but I think what is not sensitive on his part is that he's trying to shove his identity crisis on everyone else. Like, let them have Halloween, dude. Like, this doesn't have to be about them. Like, like you don't have to change the whole system for you. It'd be more like if you... If, like, the patriarch of a family went off and discovered yoga and then forced their whole family to start doing yoga every day, all day, because yoga means something to them. Which happens, though. Which does happen. It happens. I mean, it happens with religion and stuff like that all the time. Oh, And so, and so not only, because Jack's trying to, he only knows how to be himself within this ecosystem either, because part of it means that he'd have to give up maybe being, like, the head dog and i don't think he's ready to do that he likes to be in charge right well and he can't he can't fathom what that would even mean because i think you're right like mm-hmm. he comes right into that like i this is my identity as being the king being the the celebrity and then when he you know tries to 
take over Christmas, he has that harsh, you know, existential realization that he needs to be himself Mm -hmm. in order to succeed, that he can't be Santa Claus. And it takes him getting the harsh rejection of the world shooting him down. Yeah. Literally. Well, right. The Literally. When he goes goes into like the real world side of things. Cause, yeah. You know, like there's three worlds we see. We see Christmas Town, we see Halloween Town, and then we see uh, the real world. Mm-hmm. And then when he's trying to impersonate Santa Claus and bringing all of the horrible presents to children and the things that, uh, you know, cause nightmares for everybody else. But then the world rejects him to the point that they physically shoot him down. And yeah. And then he's sitting in the graveyard, like having his song where he slowly comes back to accepting the role of pumpkin king again because mm-hmm. throughout the movie like it starts with like the pumpkin king being like the re- the celebrated figure and then as soon as that song's over he goes to being like the pumpkin king and it <laughs> oh changes him, like, his tone and then <laughs> it's not until the end of the movie where he stops begrudgingly accepting that and embraces it again in his identity and he like switches to how he has to go and bring santa claus back to this world and save him from oogie boogie mm-hmm. and then comes back to the i'm jack the pumpkin king <laughs> <laughs> i mean what's because he like i he told does, you 12 times uh, you keep in count we're at three uh, we're at one too many yeah um because I, I think the, what the movie shows, too, with how he tries to do Christmas and, like, royally screws it up and everyone's sort of rejecting it because it's not true, I think is also, like, a metaphor for, like, when we are when we are trying on identity that's not us and we're trying to be somebody else and how it is clunky because it's not true and other people can sense that about us. I don't know if that's why uh, Chris Gaines uh, bombed so horribly. But, <laughs> but I think people can sense when you're not quite pulling something off. And also, in the difference with this movie is, is also you're trying to pull off something that everyone has an idea already of what that is. Yeah, absolutely. And it mean- it's really meaningful to other people and you're destroying it a little bit. But... <clears throat> I think that's why he has to, like, look it up and, like, do the scientific method and things like that is because he's still trying to be someone else other than himself in a very clunky way. Um, But, and I guess where would we see, like, with him, too, like, the burnout part of it? Um, We kind of talked about it a little bit, but, like, in this movie, when Halloween, it's the day after Halloween, they start counting to the next Halloween. So there's also that burnout of... It never really stops. The um, you don't get any breaks too, which I think he's suffering from as well. Oh, he's totally suffering from that, and that's the part where I feel like people identify with it, especially the people I know that really like this movie have to like, identify strongly with having to take on and put on a face for the world, for other people, for parents, for whoever. And Hannah touched on it really well with talking about the roles in family, all of those things. Like people have to. They get tired. They mm-hmm. just get tired because it is nonstop. Your life is nonstop. It's mm-hmm. always having to step into a role. And if you're not a person that has multiple roles or has flexibility within your roles within your life and your support system allows you to have the flexibility to be a complete person, mm-hmm. then you will struggle with the same identity issues that Jack is having, which is I am more than just this, mm-hmm. but I'm not allowed to be this and it just continuing to be this makes me feel more and more empty each time that I do it. And it's unrelentless. Like, you have to keep the same energy up about this topic or this thing or the role. Like, he doesn't even get, like, the day after Halloween off. Like, that sucks. <laughs> yeah, well, and just, and the idea of the pressure, right? The pressure of having to have the next best, most amazing idea of how we're going to make Halloween the best. Like, bigger and bigger and exactly. bigger. Exactly, and, like, and how, and how that, even the idea that, Right. Like when people have going back to like a musician, when when musicians have a hit and then everybody's like, what are you going to do next? And then the next song is like, you know, whatever and isn't as good. And then it's like, oh, well, they're not going to last anyway. So it's this idea, too, that he has this pressure that he has to perform at a certain level every time and also doesn't get a break. Like we like we've been saying, like he doesn't have you know, we could even talk about he has no room for self-care, no room to explore, because I feel like people I think about teenagers when we talk about identity and trying on different identities, right, and trying to figure out who they are and how there's a way to do that kind of in a slower, (laughs) in a slower way where you kind of just 
and try on something a little bit different. Or like maybe he gets a Santa hat and he wears it at home for a little while. Like that would be instead of stealing the holiday and, you know, kidnapping <laughs> Santa and all this other stuff that he does. So exposing Santa to psychopaths. Yeah. Maybe it's more the equivalent of you. I had a friend in high school who was very goth for a while, which didn't seem true to him. And then one day he like stood on a chair and was like, I am no longer goth. I'm going to be emo. Only like a lateral move kind of, but agreed. <laughs> but I think that is, but we see it sort of yeah, where from like nineties, nineties emo to two thousands emo was really the same thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I think it was sort of, you see that with teenagers though. Like you're saying where they're like, they make a proclamation, they decide they're going to be someone, but it's, it's still like you're putting on an idea of something you're not really being yourself absolutely um and i think what's also hard i think for something like jack's situation where you're in an environment where you're not really feeling it anymore but everyone else around you is being filled up by it still so you can feel like you're going crazy like why am i what's wrong with me that i'm not happy with something that's still making everyone around me very happy because as far as i assume they've all been doing it simultaneously all together for as, um, however many years they've been doing it and he's the only one who's maybe the only one who is like a little bit over it or not filled up by it anymore and so when you are in a system where you're the only one who's not jazzed anymore it can feel like well i, I should buck up or i'm the one who's wrong or you know is it crazy that i need something more and then how do you explain that to people who are really filled up by the thing still and, and will genuinely have a hard time understanding where you're coming from? Like that, having that conversation would be overwhelming. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And another good example of this is you see with musicians all the time, like where people get fucking tired of playing their biggest hit that mm-hmm. came out 30 years ago. Like, like uh, for mm-hmm. fuck's sake, I am so tired of playing that song. And they even uh, touched on it in, on Funny People really well. They had, uh, did you guys see that? Funny People? Yeah, like when it first came out. Maybe. Forever ago. I think it was Aziz Ansari who looked at James Taylor and was like, do you ever get tired of playing that song? Like, do you ever get tired of talking about your dick? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. Like, but the, like, the same thing, like, it, there's artists who get to the point where, like, we don't play that song anymore. Well, it's like the or Beatles. Or we play that song last. It's like yeah. they want to bridge off and then people do side projects that aren't even that successful, but why would... I mean, if it is like you get creatively burnt out, or you just get yeah. creatively bored, and so you do do things that aren't as, quote-unquote, like, financially successful or, like, popular because you're trying to fill up a need within you that, from the outside, can look bonkers because it's like, why wouldn't you want to be a Beatle anymore? Like, they're, like, right. the top, top, top. And it's because it's not filling you up. But you might feel crazy for thinking, like, why don't I want to be a Beatle anymore? Because it's fucking exhausting. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was just thinking about with Jack, I think it is clear that everybody in the town is still being filled up like this. Thinking about the way that they praise him after the parade in the opening scene. Thinking about how the mayor seems genuinely fucking excited to, like, be coming to his house. Totally. With the plans. He has two, you know, rolls of sheets of paper that he has that he's going to talk about the plans. Right, the blueprints, yep. Yeah. So I do mm-hmm. feel like that we're right about that, that in... That everybody else is still fucking pumped up to do yeah. to be doing Halloween. And I think also what's like with the mayor, I think what would be helpful for Jack, not to get into treatment territory, but he needs like more of a partner, like with like I think what would be healthy for Jack is if the mayor kind of stepped up a little bit and was more like a partner. Because even the mayor who's in charge of the town um falls apart when jack's not around he doesn't step up he just kind of freaks out and so even with the second in command like the second most powerful person than you they can't even help when you're going through something so that pressure too because in like go back to monarchy like britain has a prime minister like that probably at this point does more than the queen by miles yeah but like it's that thing where if the queen fell apart then the prime minister would be fine and the vice versa and so to then be in a situation where you can't even depend on the like the also most important person besides you to keep it together like that is that would cause burnout and pressure as well yeah absolutely Mm -hmm. and so i know we talked about midlife crises um that we call it more like it's an existential crisis is how we call it in therapy, which you can have at any age. I know it's kind of buzzy now to also say like quarter life crisis or like 
I think millennials are having a crisis moment, but that's not to get into a soapbox, onto a soapbox about all the, oh, real, I'll get on that all the real factors that we have to worry about, like climate change and student loans and the upcoming another recession. And, and the crushing that, and, reality that we can't afford rent. Yep. With- or to buy houses and have real, like, uh, stuff, collateral. <laughs> but anyway, um, the point I'm trying to make is that you can have an existential crisis at any age. It doesn't have to be a midlife crisis, but that's more how it's the trope yeah. that's been presented in the world. And usually men, where they do have that, they're in their 40s to 50s, they leave their wife, start fucking around with, like, a 20-year-old, and, like, buy a red sports car and, like, grow a goatee. <laughs> um, and And why we make fun of that is because it looks silly because in those, I'm assuming in those situations, it feels wrong because they're trying something on. They're trying youth on as an identity, the way that Jack's trying Christmas on as an identity. And it's not quite fitting or making sense or feeling true. Right. And then it's not until they find a way to accept their new reality. Yes. That they return to a point of health whatever that means is like you know, right but when, when we hit like these existential crises like existentialism is a term that isn't used as much anymore it was a big movement in psychology in like the 60s 70s but it's not something that is so popular now and that's mostly because of a rebrand honestly is that it's more in the mindfulness mm-hmm. um but the the concept of existentialism is that we have basic fears. We all have basic fears of being uh, that come with being alive and that everyone has to deal with them. And that when they hit, when something triggers those fears, it can cause dramatic reaction to avoid the intense feelings that come from facing those fears head on. Cosmo, I just want you to know that one day... You're going to be dead or you're going to die. <laughs> you're going to die like everybody else. <laughs> That's, That's from Moonstruck, which we will do eventually on here. Yeah. But it is that thing where she asks, she talks about, the wife talks about like what's going on. Why do men do crazy stuff? No, why do men cheat? She why do asked, men cheat? She asks several different men throughout the movie, why do men cheat? And it's because they're scared to of death. death. Um, and But easily yeah. the most unstable person is the one who gives her the answer that she wants. So it's kind of yeah. like here or there. But anyway. Sidebar. <clears throat> but Sidebar. I think um, for Jack, kind of thinking back on what you were saying, Ben, is um, you have to kind of make, like, make, not make peace. That sounds kind of a bummer. But um, Kind of resolve. wrap your head around, resolve like these new feelings you're having and your reality. Cause, um, I would say with Jack, how he gets around to that and how people do it in real life is you don't have to be a hundred percent filled up all the time by your life. I think people wig and just dump their lives out entirely because they're not as happy, quote unquote, as they used to be. Mm-hmm. And it's like well, one, you don't have to totally revamp your whole entire life to try to like breathe some life back into you. Like it can be less black and white than that and it can be more like what are parts are making us feel a, a type of way and is that stuff that we do need to juggle or modify but it doesn't have to be like you don't have to get divorced maybe you go you like have a talk with your spouse about what's going on that you're lacking or like you don't have to get a sports car <laughs> like it's like or is it more that i don't feel excited anymore what could help me feel excited like do i need hobbies or Stuff like that. Or, and also it's kind of accepting that, like, like I said, like, you don't have to be living at a hundred all the time. Right. Like, how do we find contentment? Like, people say this a lot, but like, you don't necessarily want to be happy all the time. We want to be content because if you were happy all the time, you'd look, you'd be, it's unsustainably because it's like almost like mania. Like, I was going to say, yeah, all the time. it's unsus, it's not sustainable um, mm-hmm. to be to be in that setting um, in general. And so, and I think with, and I think the situation with Jack, I, I do kind of wish that we knew like how many years it had been mm-hmm. just to kind of put it into context. Like, has he always been I know, alone? Like, like, was he a was prince? there a pumpkin was king like, before? <laughs> yeah, like, was he a little pumpkin prince? prince? Like, I don't know. But prince. anyway, 
rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Just makes me think about that. No, but I think it's a, no, but I think you're making a good point. Like, was he always isolated? Is this a role that he's used to, or is this a role that revol- like evolved over time? Like him being like the only like, why doesn't he have a pumpkin queen? Like, why doesn't he have pumpkin kids? <laughs> like. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe he will because I think he and Sally. To be the pumpkin king. I hate that and don't do that again. Yeah. <laughs> but I stop. <laughs> but I think we do see that he finds Sally, which and maybe she'll be pumpkin queen, <laughs> and they'll have little pumpkin uh, Frankenstein doll skeleton babies. I don't know. Yeah. But I mean, we can shift into talking about Sally, but I think that is something he finds that is helpful. I don't love the narrative of like which we see in other movies, which is romance will solve your mental health. Because I think with Jack, right, trope alert. it doesn't seem like necessarily he has an underlying mental health diagnosis or condition. He's going through something that's causing depressive symptoms or anxiety. But I think finding Sally is a way for him to decrease his isolation, increase his supports, and also increase his vulnerability in a way that's, probably relieving for him um in a appropriate way now we can get more into this with like treatment but or just thinking this through we want to make sure that he doesn't make her his whole world where it's like now you have to be the one that fills me up and when you stop filling me up i dump you and move on to someone else you always want to make sure that you don't just move your issues into another space instead of really dealing with them um which would be my concern with jack is that he's just looking constantly looking for the thing that's going to make him feel better in a way that does is not realistic but i don't think that's not the vibe i get but it could but with sally and also because sally is another person in the story who is struggling with who she is but in a very different way so what do we see with sally that makes us think about her with identity I think that the first thing we see about Sally is that she feels so trapped. She's also very isolated in a very different context. That she is idealizing a symbol, which is Jack. And yes. she is projecting what life could be like if she could be like that or be around him or be with him. She's got a crush on him. She does, but it's more than that. It's more than that. Again, and that's what... Like, makes their particular story interesting is that when she starts to see him as a person, not a symbol, that they are able to have more of a relationship. And when he stops rejecting himself, that he's able to connect to her because he's not dealing with his shit. When he gets his head out of his ass. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was going to say. I mean, yeah. (laughs) Especially when she, like, flat tells him in multiple ways, multiple times that he has his head in his ass and what he's doing is not going to work and he ignores her. And he's like, is that a woman speaking? I don't think right. I, was that the wind? Yeah. <laughs> I think that's exactly what going. happened. Yeah, yeah. Th- that's what it was, though. It's like she flat tells his ass, like, hey, this is going to go real bad. Like, this has a look, like, they're not doing this like Christmas is supposed to be. This is going to go bad. But we'll get on that later. Yeah. Um, the But what we see with Sally is like she's trying to find her own place in the world that's not cooped up in being the creepy love item slash daughter slash creation of yeah. weird duck doctor man yeah, yeah. and i yeah. think that you're absolutely right i think that part of this is that again as usual we don't have more information and so i think like it's on a clear. female character no way <laughs> yeah right no shit so but the fact that she was also made by him but clearly is uh like the housekeeper or has to do whatever he says um but also can be her room like she can be locked into so it definitely seems like and also i think the the way that the evil the doctor guy is uh interacts with her and kind of everything questions everything that she does Mm -hmm. which i feel like is a for is like a very small version of gaslighting like every time Mm -hmm. she does anything like he's really suspicious when he goes to eat the soup even though we know there's stuff in it which also yeah because you fucking deserve it you prick but also that um there's hannah sugarcoating that when they had that when they have 
that he's always second guessing her. So that also could lead to when you're in an abusive relationship, that can also lead to you second guessing yourself and your identity being very confusing for for you because it feels like you don't know. I don't know who I am. Am I an object? Am I a person? Am I his daughter? Does he or does is he in love with me? Or am, and also, why am I not allowed to do anything by myself? Well, I think for I mean, I assume for Sally, it's probably more which is what you're saying, but the broad thing of like, why do I exist? Like, yeah. who am I for this person? He, ha- I mean, it is kind of that weird power dynamic that I think, I hopefully it doesn't happen so much nowadays, but I'm sure it happened a lot back in the day. If you were like an only daughter with a, with a father where like you are like the, female role in the family so it's like you take care of them like you do everything you do whatever. everything short of fucking them basically you know hopefully not doing that but you know what i mean where it's this like weirdly intimate partnership but like also you're demoralized because you're the woman in that partner sh- in that situation and constantly being trivialized and pushed down and with her it's hyper like um hyper intense <laughs> that's what i'm looking for because she's also locked up like you're saying like she is being confined literally and figuratively by this her creator and also in the way that an abusive parent does is constantly reminding her that i like created you i take care of you so it's also that abusive state of you are ungrateful i am in charge of you i gave you life which we hear from people and so you i deserve to treat you however i want and you should be grateful just because you are alive and i'm quote unquote taking care of you whatever that definition is yeah, and i uh, have control and i have control of everything I'm right sorry, oh no go ahead yeah there's just a like, complete manipulation and it makes sense why she's looking outside of her world to see something that looks glamorous and why she sees that as a solution to her problems because her reality is so controlled and inconsistent and confusing and uh, you know, terrible that she's, you know, like willing to poison her <laughs> daddy lover creator man. I don't know even know how, what yeah. to classify him. I as. know it's yeah. abuser. We'll call him abuser. Well, yeah, how about yeah, that? We just call him the abusive, the mm-hmm. abuser, the abuser. The there, there you go. Yes. So uh, she like she's willing to poison and take risks and go out into a world she's unfamiliar with that's unsafe to her with this idea of what it could be like this idealized fictionalized thing that she's created a fantasy about in her head Mm -hmm. until like because that is so much more appealing than her reality that even if it's not true or it isn't like that Mm -hmm. it's not what she's currently living and it's something that she feels she needs to experience in order to gain that identity that's being crushed out of her by this abuser yeah and i think that another part of this that just popped into my head is when people are in a situation like that, sometimes the person that they choose next is also abusive because they have right. this idealized version of what it could be like and have a hard time identifying that and also have a hard time identifying the abuse and or the red flags that might pop up because at least it's not the other person. Mm-hmm. Um, and that being treated even slightly differently feels different enough that anything else is acceptable. Or like positive enough. Exactly. So I think that that's part of um, like Sally, because also like Sally is kind of like pursuing Jack sort of like not really aggressively, clearly. And he is not into her. Like, they're friends or whatever, but, like, even when she's sewing, like, I came to you because you're the best seamstress. Like, he didn't come to her because he's attracted to her. He came to her because she's the only one who knows how to sew in the town. Well, he it's the classic story. Like, he's hes emotionally unavailable. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. he he's not into her because he's not into anybody. Right. He, I, he can't yeah. be into anybody because he's doing his shit. Yeah. Period. You know, like he's, he's, but you're right. It's that, that seeking for, seeking attention from those that are emotionally unavailable because of you're trying to interact with the fantasy that you've projected onto them. And that is a trap that people who are emotionally starved for positive attention or being abused in some way fall into over and over that leads to repeating a cycle of abuse. Even if it's not in the same way, it creates similar patterns. And we're, and also like you're saying, they don't recognize, when they're getting inappropriate positive attention that as 
red flag written all over it, like someone who's crossing boundaries and crossing lines to give you that positive attention and it's over the top and overt and you don't recognize that that is predatory. I mean, do we, th- but do we think that Jack's abusive towards her? Jack? No. Uh, I, no. Okay. I don't think. Boogie that- boogie. I don't think that Jack is abusive towards her, but I think that she is seeking a relationship with somebody who is not available. Right. I think In she... Re- but I don't think that yeah. Jack would be abusive. No, I don't mm. think that. Okay. I just brought that up. I don't know if I was missing something. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, I just brought it up because I feel like that's something that can happen. Well, I think more what I felt concerned about for her when I was watching it is that she is already taking on more of a caregiver role with Jack, like giving him the food, stuff like that, like seeking more seeking out someone. I think she can tell that he's sad. Like she's one of the few people that has the emotional insight to look at Jack and be like, he's going through something Yeah, like seeing a bit of herself in him, Mm -hmm. which I think says a lot about how great she is. But I, then I think like she silently gives him the food without necessarily wanting recognition. So my worry for her would be that she's going to, because of herself, like even if he's a great partner for her, that she'll won't ask for her and advocate for herself in that relationship. Yeah. Like she'll continue to be like the caretaker role that was instilled in her by her abuser. And or that they will naturally fall into that because he's a little cocky, confident, spoiled, rich kid. And Mm -hmm. she is someone who is submissive by just because of how she was raised or maybe feels like she should be submissive because she's not a submissive person. Like she's a pretty strong. I mean, she breaks out. She breaks out every time he does something. I mean, she's she's fine without her arm. She literally took leaves and were sticking in her arm. Like, I don't care. You take my fucking arm. I'm still going to leave. Like, Like, she is pretty badass, actually. So it. But I think that she does show little signs of that. She maybe wouldn't like make sure she has an equal role in the relationship that Jack has. Right. She I mean, she doesn't know how. Yeah, it would would take work. And we get into that in treatment. That that would be somewhere where she would need. Uh, Mm -hmm. A lot of work on is figuring out how to communicate those things and how to get her needs met without defaulting to the role that she knows and understands, which is what we tend to do uh, Mm -hmm. when we've had that modeled for us. And that's what we know we've gotten reinforced for is that it would the thing that we're drawing attention to is that there's a lot of hallmarks here of if this were something real of her being in the situation she is with wanting to connect and having connection and Jack not necessarily being super emotionally available throughout most of the film and then uh, getting into a situation with someone like that where you're giving more and more to try to elicit that response back Mm -hmm. out of them which often creates a trap because that doesn't always result in what the person giving more and more of themselves for they don't get it back yeah I mean I think they're just in danger I think they're both great kids but i think they're in danger of falling into a lopsided relationship where he wants something that fills him up a lot if he's not managing that for himself and then she's someone who probably might be allow herself to be um squashed a little bit or to be put in that role of caregiver especially if for the most part he is really kind to her and Mm -hmm. so she'll she won't like you're saying hannah won't recognize that she could be asking for more like it could be a thing where he is great. Like, he's very sweet to her and loving <clears throat> her. And he thinks he's being the best partner he can be. But she does all the chores and she does all the emotional labor. And she can't be as vulnerable as he ha- like he is. She can't have hard days where she's not on for him. Um, and I, they could be someone that's in that kind of uneven dynamic forever, for a really long time, until maybe one of them snaps. I mean, I think we see that... Um, with a lot of especially like more old school dynamics in relationships where people will come to couples counseling like after their kids have left the nest because they're not happy with this dynamic they've fallen into for so long where one I mean usually more of an old school dynamic where the man does his role and the woman has her role and now it's played out for them they're not feeling it anymore in a positive way. And I think you brought up a really good point about Sally not being aware of what her needs are in a relationship and how, and how, again, not saying that Jack's going to not work out, but just that how she might not be able to realize the things that she needs Mm -hmm. until she maybe does some work, which again, we can talk about in treatment. Um, But I do think that that is a part of um, 
a part of the struggle of coming out of a, a uh, an abusive relationship is that then it can be hard to identify what you need because none of your needs were being met and also you weren't allowed to have any. Yes. And so when you're all of a sudden in a place where it maybe can be more equal or where you can ask for what you need and Jack would happily give it to her, but she can't ask for it and therefore then might have some growing resentment, which is where I think you were going with mm-hmm. people coming in later because they've fallen into this dynamic that is no longer comfortable. And But no um, one's talking about it exactly because and also sometimes because all the focus can go to the kids and then they're the couple relationship just like goes down goes Mm -hmm. down the toilet Mm -hmm. um yeah but she is like i like we've been talking about prognostically i think she there's some like her prognosis in my mind is pretty good though because she clearly has a strong idea of what she doesn't want and she has the will to go through with what she has Absolutely. to do to get her needs met i mean she is straight up repeatedly poisoning her abuser <laughs> and then she like i remember just thinking wow she keeps like a sewing kit in her pocket for when she inevitably has to sew her limbs back on my, my assumption is it doesn't really hurt her she doesn't really behave in a way where it causes her physical pain but maybe she doesn't realize that because she's used to it we can get into all that kind of thing absolutely but she is a very like when we assess people for therapy or just psychology in general part of what you assess for is like their will and their wants and their like as um factors to how progressive therapy will be for them like what's their well, what their, their motivation. like their strengths it's usually a strength yeah. is how like motivated they are and yeah. how much they're willing to work for the things that they're wanting and she that's strong within her Absolutely. like she's got great will <laughs> oh she does she's super resilient and determined i think that she shows that over and over like you're saying i think the, the only thing that i'm concerned about with her is that that um pattern of abuse that she's been through could distort her idea of what's normal. Oh, sure. And especially when she's idolizing what Jack was. Now, granted, that's not the way the story turns out. But, like, in the middle, we see Mm. her going to go through this process where she's, like, idolizing what Jack is. And I would be concerned that she would place so much hope Mm -hmm. into the idolization of Jack that she could get herself into uh, a situation where it would take longer for that more resilient side of her to turn out and realize what the situation is if it didn't go well. Mm-hmm. But also I think maybe one thing we should touch upon is the cultural factor or maybe poisoning people in this town is like how you spend a Friday night. Like, you know, I don't know. I mean, we're I also, we're also assuming, I mean, like they talk about like killing, like when they were trying to like, um, shift like Christmas into the ideas that Halloween, people had. like they yeah. have a more, um, like a warped sensibility. And so, it's when we work with people, we want to make sure we're being culturally sensitive. And so we don't want to make judgment calls like you're proposing someone like every week. I mean, he lives through it, obviously. Like he's probably a creature more than a person. But we want to make sure that we don't push upon, like right. push our understandings of situations onto a person. We have to be culturally sensitive. Now, I know what you mean in terms of like is the norm super bad like when we talk about like Matilda in our last episode of where she's had a lot of conduct behavior conduct disorder behaviors normalized for her by her family um that's different because she's within a society where that's not normal whereas with Sally we don't know how much of it is just like normal for everybody right right I mean like if you're gonna like if you were to do therapy with the Adams family, which is yeah. probably what this world is strongly based on, I think mm-hmm. um, you would you would have to be aware of like the stuff that they find entertaining or erotic mm-hmm. or whatever uh, it, is part of their culture and mm-hmm. is not harmful and is fun for them, and you'd have to understand the difference. But mm-hmm. I think with the poisoning thing in this one, like his reaction to it is not like like sure they probably use the poison for fun on each other, but like he <sighs> seems more annoyed, right? Than he, like. Well, You're trying also to kill because, me, bitch. Well, and also because <laughs> it looks like it just puts him to sleep. Right. Yes. The other thing that makes me think about this is also the way that they keep all of their things, like how they have Nightshade. And mm-hmm. I don't know that you really need that for anything, usually. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> usually when not. it comes to <laughs> murdering folks. Yeah. So it's also this thing where I feel like based on the fact that they definitely have a whole bunch of different things that might harm people kind of feels like I, th- I think you're right that the that there might be a sense in this culture that this is something that like sometimes you do this around Halloween. Maybe. Yeah. 
I would also say the flip side of the relationship. So Doc, the abuser, the father figure. Um, I think what seeing as through the eyes of a child therapist, I think the note I wrote down was, if you push your kid too hard, you will be poisoned. <laughs> <Which> is, <laughs> but I think what I mean by that is he's not learning from the situation. Like right. he keeps trying to force his hand with her, no matter all the vile things she does to him. He's not learning from it either as the parent role and being like, What's going on for you that you're going to these lengths to get away from me? Like, maybe I should let up. Maybe I should do something different because you are actively poisoning me on a regular basis. And also losing your limbs. Yeah. There's like no away from me. Like that's like that's a kid running away in a consistent basis because they have because they physically can no longer stay in an Mm -hmm. abusive situation to survive. And I have parents who I mean. There are certain situations where you do want to keep pushing your authority on your kid because they need to respect that because of what they're doing. And that's more of a kid who's like super conduct behavior But then there are situations where I talk to parents and I'm like, you need to pull back because the kid's reaction isn't helpful. And it's getting into this bad pattern where you just hate each other and they're always doing something to you and you're pushing on them and it's just horrendous negativity all the time and so um so that's why i wrote that note because i'm like people need parents need to learn which is a nuanced thing and took me a while as a child therapist to know when to advocate for pushing harder versus backing off you know it's a really case by case situation but in this situation he's obviously pushing too hard to try to just break her Mm -hmm. when she's obviously someone who will not be broken by him definitely not yeah. So when we go into treatment, um, who do we think of for treatment? I guess I'll go. I think of Sally. Uh, I think that working with her, there's a pattern of abuse that we've been talking about and the things that she would need to have help with, I think, if she would want it, would be figuring out her, what her sense of identity outside of this pattern of abuses and how that she can live a life that brings meaning to her without needing to cater to other people more than she wants to. Like taking care of other people, if that's a role that some people take to naturally is okay, and that's fine. But like doing so in a way that allows you to be consistent with having your own identity and taking care of your own needs as well. And I think for her, working with her on that would be something that would be very helpful. Um, and I guess no, my mind shifted more to Jack, so I'm going to jump on that. Well, I, I just thought of something with what you're saying. Is yeah. I wonder, too, it would, if it would be helpful for her to work with a male therapist because it would be an opportunity for her to advocate to herself, be vulnerable with a man, advocate her needs to a man. Um, yeah. I think this would be a situation where I don't, my intuition is that it would maybe be more helpful than harmful because we always have to think about that right sure. because like her abuser was a man but obviously she's not scared of men she's gravitating towards a man so it's not super bad in that context but i wonder with her like yeah it would be a way for her to practice vulnerability with a male in a safe structure mm-hmm. and then be able to tell you her needs and you know you accept those that information without trying her right like the the concept of like working with her on a treatment plan i think would be a super empowering uh, mm-hmm. experience for her because you'd have someone going like let's talk about your needs like and usually that process with a therapist is somewhat of a negotiation where the therapist will might suggest okay here's the things that i see what are the things that you would like to work on and like going through that kind of experience with her where both of you are talking about like she's brought up the situations that she feels are an issue and the therapist may have insight onto things the therapist sees as well. And going through that process of a negotiation of a treatment plan where she would have the opportunity to state what her needs are, plan for them and direct things towards that in the way that she feels most useful. I think that would be a very powerful experience for her. Mm-hmm. And then uh, with her like doing... Honestly, CBT would be good. Uh, I think setting up behavior experiments with her, like helping her to plan to recognize whatever automatic uh, dysfunctional thoughts she may have about herself or about what's going on and then work on challenging herself to behave a little bit differently than her 
default behavior is from the experience of being abused to see what trying on a bit of a different response would feel like and working on reinforcing that, processing that, and coming up with ways to start to eventually shape her behavior more towards a direction that she considers healthy and gets her more closer to the self she wants to be. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that I would do... You know, I think that I would do Jack and Sally. uh, I think what would be really interesting for them, and I do this work with uh, premarital couples when they come in um, and they just kind of want to check in and learn some tools before they before they get married, which is really um, works really well and is really a, a really helpful move in terms of trying to get ahead of something and or to try to learn healthier ways to have communication with each other. Um, and I think in a lot of times when it comes to couples therapy, the sooner, the better, almost always. Um, and what I would say about Jack and Sally is having, I think, doing couples with them and having talking to them about communication, because I'd also feels like Jack is somebody who's like been on a, on a pulpit, right? Mm-hmm. Like spouting his ideas that everyone takes as, you know, the It'd probably most, be hard for him to be in a relationship. The most important thing ever. And Sally has been a person who listens to somebody who's on a pulpit. So helping them have communication and, and just working out different ways that they can talk to each other and talk about their needs and talk about what they want their relationship to look like. Because it also appears as though neither one of them has had any kind of romantic relationship from what we can see in the movie. Yeah, definitely not. Yeah. So I think I would really want to help them, uh, you know, using um, a communication skill that I usually teach people and also checking in with them about the different ways that they feel love, which is really important to have some specific things because it's because we're not all the same. For some people, you know, getting hugged four times a day will like make your whole week. For other people, it's, you know, taking the garbage out. For some people, it's bringing home something that reminds you of them or something that you thought they might like or need. So it's just different for everyone. And I feel like, especially with Sally, she might not have any awareness of what that could be because she's only, she's mostly only had interactions of negativity with her, with her primary caregiver, I guess, for Mm -hmm. her her abuser, I guess, is a better way to put it. And so she doesn't have any, maybe have any awareness of how she accepts love and how, um, and how it would be important to help them both learn that. And also so that Sally has maybe a more realistic idea of what that might look like for both of them. So that's what I would do. Um, I would do couples therapy with Jack and Sally. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering with Sally as well, if it would be helpful for her to do a group like do group therapy of maybe like a group of people who have come from abusive households, abusive parental households, especially if they've been highly isolated the way that she has um, to get other people's um, stories as well that sort of um, both normalize and unnormalize her experience, like makes her really realize like, oh, that happened to me too. So that was an abusive behavior or like, I think she'd get a lot out of, um, Oh, what's the word for it? It's the universality of group where you really recognize that your problems aren't just your problems or you weren't the one who created it. That listening to other people have had similar stories and making it realize that it wasn't just your fault, like singular to you, like some people just do horrible things to other people. And it has nothing to do with who you are as a person because you're hearing stories of like eight other people that have that done to them as well. So I think it would be good because I think she just doesn't have a lot of perspective because her world has been so small. So mm-hmm. I think a group therapy setting would be helpful to give her some perspective of about the behaviors that were harmful in her relationship, which I think she does have some idea of because she's poisoning him. So obviously she knows. But I think for moving forward then, maybe also getting the support. I think getting a support system that's outside of Jack as well, I think would be very good for her. Um, Just so that I just, I think I continue to worry that her and Jack are just going to unhealthily glom to each other. Yeah. Because they think that that they are the capital A answer for each other, which is not healthy and um, won't make them happy. Nope. And so I think making sure they both have systems outside of themselves to rely on, diversify your support system. I'm a big advocate for that, which I think most therapists are. But... Huge. Huge um, I mean, I run... I'm getting a little off my topic, but 
I think when I work a lot with couples and things like that, that there can be this idea that you have to be everything for me. And if you're not, then what's wrong with us? And so um, I tell people that's why we don't just have romantic partners. We also have best friends. We have family. We have like, you know, work friends, too. Like you can split a little bit up um, your needs amongst the people in your lives, um, because I would imagine for maybe Sally, there's going to be stuff that's going to be hard for her to experience or to hear about from Jack because of her background. And so is it that Jack just talks about those things with other people or right. vice versa? I mean, you know? I, yeah, and I definitely think Jack and Sally would be I would definitely recommend individual therapy. I don't do that for everyone, but I would definitely recommend individual therapy. I think her going to group is a really great idea. I think that mm-hmm. would be really I think I think you're absolutely right about just that. Just because her world's been so <clears throat> small. Yes. Right. And so skewed. And what we need to avoid happening is them getting into a situation where they get enmeshed to the point where they create these expectations on each other and for the roles that they fill in their life that are just impossible for any person to meet. Mm-hmm. And I have seen that several times with couples where you find people who um, are so involved with each other and have f- – they get into this unfortunate situation where they maybe see each other as the savior yes. to their problems and mm-hmm. like they're the savior to the problems that they had in their family of origin or growing up or in their friend group or what have you. And like this person is the end all be all for me. But when that person can't sustain that because no one can ever, and then you start to have problems and the pressure from both sides to be perfect creates a lot of the things that we see in Jack where the mask you wear starts to slip Mm -hmm. and the roles you're trying to fill are get untenable and it can create that existential crisis feeling of I can't do this anymore. Yeah. All right. So final thoughts about Nightmare Before Christmas. I feel like this is like Matilda, which we all have this from very different energies or backgrounds. Yes. Okay. I'll go first. So, um, I, I've never seen that had never seen this movie before. Um, and it was really pretty to watch, and I liked the music. I think I don't love it, but I would probably watch it again. Like, I don't, I, I also don't, I don't feel like I it's hate it. like three in a row. But I don't feel like I hated it. And it's also, a harmless, fun movie. Exactly. And what I would, what I actually am thinking right now, what I think I would want to do is watch it with a niece or nephew. Yeah. And I feel like that would really shift how I thought about it. Because I think being a grown ass person and watching this, I was, I was a little bored. And that doesn't happen. I love cartoons and I usually love watching little kid movies um, and just generally enjoy them. So this one, I, um, not quite so much, but still was fun to watch. And um, yeah, so I'm pretty sure I would watch it again. I'll go because I know Brittany loves this movie. So yes. we'll let her close that out because <laughs> yes. there are many of you out there that love it. I am not yeah. one of them. I don't hate it, uh, but it it doesn't do it for me. I, I, I appreciate the art that goes into it. I think like I feel similarly to Hannah that like I, when I watch it, I'm like, wow, this is a really awesome achievement. And yeah. what they did with it is great. And uh, Danny Elfman's music is great and the way he like I could listen to the soundtrack I, I really like the soundtrack I love This Is Halloween I, I could listen to that over and over but watching the film all the way through like, it loses me I, I just lose my interest but like, Danny Elfman's music is great we all know that you know like I have to love Danny Elfman's music because he gave us the Batman theme You're such an asshole you are <laughs> such an asshole I know but <laughs> and in The Simpsons and he, he he's given us a lot of Movies where his music is great, and this is Jack is him singing. Yeah, mm-hmm. yes, yeah, I knew that. Yeah, like yeah. That, that's his voice. You know, the, the guy that plays Prince Humperdinck is the speaking voice, but yeah. uh, you know, for Jack to be the the singing voice is all Danny Elfman, and like to to he did a great job of connecting to Jack's plight, and he's like, and I think in interviews he said like, in many ways I identify with Jack, and I think a lot of people do. So I see why people like it and why it's so iconic. But I find myself losing attention halfway through. I, I love the shit out of Oogie Boogie. Uh, his <laughs> he's the best part. I feel like, like his cabaretness and like the uh, yeah, his is great. And but like this is Halloween and Oogie Boogie. I really like. But I did the movie. Just it's not something I watch over and over again. Um, I saw it as a kid, and when everyone was going nuts when it first came out, I was like, oh, huh, I want to go see this. And then I watched. it. I was like, ah, <laughs> it's cool, but eh. um. 
I don't think it's bad. I just, it doesn't, it doesn't trip that legendary trigger for me. I can see how it does for some people, but for me, I think it's good and I respect it, but it's not my thing. Um, I didn't watch this movie until I was like a teenager. Um, aesthetically, I really like it and that I really like Tim Burton movies, even though I know he didn't direct it, it is presented by him. And mm-hmm. so it's very much like that aesthetic. I think it is the grandfather of a lot of movies that I love, like Coraline's done by all the same people. Now, Coraline's a movie that we'll hopefully we'll one day do on here. But that's more that's a movie that I'll watch over and over again. Like I love Coraline and I didn't watch that till I was way into adulthood because that's when it came out. Um, and I find that much more compelling, but it's the same aesthetic, which I really like. I th- agree with you, Ben, though, that I probably listen to the soundtrack way more than I ever feel like watching the movie. Like, I don't, I don't know last time I watched the movie. It's one of those that I catch on TV when it's on. Mm-hmm. Right. But I'm very much more connected to the soundtrack. Like, I start listening to that as soon as, like, it's September 1st. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's much more aligned with Halloween for me. I think it is for a lot of people, but I think why people like this movie so much is because it covers two holidays, which I think is why it is such a big part of the zeitgeist, is that you can watch it from Halloween to Christmas. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, I, and story-wise, I think watching it now as like an adult woman, I definitely connect more with Sally than Jack. I think... It's just a societally, you know, in this economy, it's really hard to <laughs> connect with a sad, rich, I'm going to assume white, straight man, um, even yeah. though he's a skeleton. I mean, he's I actually physically white, so, yeah. you know. But I, th- I think it's hard right now to, like, feel, like, ugh, for, like, for a guy who has king. everything, who's, like, struggling and then fucks up a whole other holiday right. to get his needs well, met. Appropriates, and then it's appropriate. So culturally yes, appropriate. And then yes. um, gets White a big people parade. people are not for doing that at all, are they? And then he yeah. gets a big parade for solving the problem he created. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, I mean, he kind of sucks. Like, he's as much of the villain of the story as he is the hero, if not maybe more the villain. He's, like, then when he's, like, in the end and he's singing that grave, he's, like, maybe I did fuck this up. It's, like, all right. Like, so I think watching it through the eyes of a therapist i was like this guy kind of sucks <laughs> um and that he just ruins everything around him because he can't look inward which i do think we see a lot in like powerful white men yeah is or like really cocky people who are the victim of their own hubris yeah which is i don't think i need to look at myself i just think i need to ruin everything around me and wreak havoc because i'm going through something which i do think in the trope of a midlife crisis yeah like there the trope of it is like a man who will fuck up his wife's life, fuck up his kid's life, fuck up other things because he needs to feel jazzed up again. But right. I'm not going to go to therapy. I'm just going to explode things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So I would say I like this movie. I will listen to the soundtrack probably till I die. But it's not a movie that I want to revisit visually over and over again the way that I love Coraline. You know, not just to keep directly comparing them. But um, so... With that, we um, wrap it up. Um, you can always find us at um, Instagram and Facebook at Popcorn Psychology. You can find us at Twitter at Popcorn underscore Psych. We have a Patreon now, um, which you can find the link to in our Instagram bio. Or- and get some swag, interact yeah. with us, find mm-hmm. out what our top five favorites for every month are. Yeah. Also, Pick if you just, an episode if you yeah. want to. Yeah. And also, if you just, like, appreciate us and, like, for Christmas want to, like, throw some gifts our way, we love to see it. Um, you can also <laughs> find and review us at Apple Podcasts. It's one of the most helpful ways to support us for free. If you do want to support our podcast, um, that is the way that other people find us. Um, so, yeah. And you can always email us at pop, um, at popcornpsychology at gmail.com and give us some, you know, some feedback if you'd like. Tell us what your favorite Christmas movie is. And we will see you next time.